Hi, Travis. It's Hello. It's great to have you here today with us. It's good to be here. Everybody's very excited of you being here. I, I'm excited as well. <laughs> <laughs> so this is taking time. We can we can we can play the clock out. This is all good. <laughs> so if I understood you well, you do not do not want to fight public authorities anymore. You want to embrace them more or less. So you're kind of like waving the white flag a little bit, which is quite a big change for compared to what you did till now. It ri reminds me a tiny little bit on a story I read in the Bible about a guy called Saul who became the good guy and renamed himself into Paul. And I'd like to know, can I still call you Travis today? I might change my middle name. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm not, I, I, I'm, I'm not familiar with the story, but... Uh... <laughs> you don't need to. So, okay. great. Travis is a beautiful name. We should okay. stay there. Right. I'd like to share two thoughts with you yeah. um, I had when you were just talking, if I may. I use Uber quite a bit, and you said um, Uber might be very good for the environment in the yeah. future. Actually, I stopped uh, taking my bicycle since Uber exists. Mm. So, I do take the car now and I didn't take it before. And another thought, I just came here by Uber, yeah. and uh, my driver told me that she can't make her living with the Uber drives, mm. so she just did a taxi license. Yeah. So I'd like to know, you were talking about creating jobs. Yeah. I'm not so sure. Now, are you, are, the ride you're referring to, was it here in Munich? Here in Munich, right. So we've had particularly diffi particular difficulty growing supply here in Munich. And what that means is that demand outstrips supply. And when demand out, because everybody wants to get an Uber, um, but when demand outstrips supply, then that means pickup times are long. When pickup times are long, then the, the driver has a lot of downtime. And then the problem is, is the driver doesn't make enough money. And so in cities where we're not able to efficiently grow supply is where we get into a tricky situation um, in terms of making the system work, sort of what I would call exit velocity. Uh, it ends up resulting in what, what is known as surge pricing, it <clears throat> raising prices, but then of course, then fewer users want to use it. And so you get in this place where you, you get a little bit stuck. Now, the business here in Munich is starting to grow and it will get better over time. What I can tell you is when it, when it gets 10 times bigger than it is now, that driver will do twice as many trips per hour. And when that driver does twice as many trips per hour, then the income that that driver sees starts to really matter. Okay. That's a very interesting point you're mentioning. Um, actually, we're living in a time of permanent terror warnings at the moment, in Europe especially, sadly. And everybody remembers, I think, the Sydney hostage taking and the fact that prices, Uber prices went up four times. And I'd like to know, what are you doing? Like, what measures are you taking yeah. so that things like that won't happen again? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, obviously our hearts go out for whether it's Sydney or some of the, uh, some of the things that have happened in, uh, in Paris. Uh, remember, our, our teams, our teams we're, we're not a typical tech company, right? So we have people in every city that we operate in. And the teams that operate Uber in that city are the sons and daughters of that city. So we're part of that community. Um, our policy is clear on this, which is um, any state of emergency, any kind of just serious emergency of any kind, surge pricing gets turned off. It gets tricky when we don't know what's going on. Um, but you can build technology that starts to identify anomalies like this and turns it off right as it happens. And then ultimately we can use the supply that is at our, you know, that, that we're connected to, to help people get in and out of a situation, let's say. Maybe help authorities get in, other people get out. Um, work with charities if there's recovery. So we've done a lot of work with the Red Cross in the U.S. with hurricanes and other storms that have happened. Um, but we just need to, the playbook is there. We need to make sure that playbook is distributed to all the city teams and, and that they know how to act quickly um, when something happens. 
The problem I see is that that might, might take the two or three minutes uh, people need when they want to get out there. But anyways, we'll see what, uh, what measures you take with sure. that. Another well, for instance, in the Hebdo, in the, in, you know, in this, the incidents in Paris, we saw that happen real time, and surge was turned off immediately across the entire city. Okay, interesting. Right. Mm -hmm. um, a few days ago, it got really late. Public transportation stops quite early here in Munich. So I took a Uber, yeah. and I was very happy that I had a female driver, actually, because I couldn't stop thinking about the security issues. Like in India, a female client was yeah. raped by a guy who was known for his violent history. So I'd like to know, do you think that you still choose your drivers too laxly? I didn't hear the last part of that question. Do I do still too much choose? choose the drivers too laxly? Like, do you, don't you control them enough before they get a Uber, uh, be, before, oh, they before they become they get a Uber onboarded onto driver? Uber. Exactly. So, um, I mean, look, I think, I mean, the first part is a situation like what you've described is pretty terrible. Um, I think all of us have mothers, wives, daughters, sisters. <laughs> exactly. I understand. Um, so, so we um, we want to. So, I mean, the first part is just we want to make sure that that never happens. There's things we can do when we're onboarding drivers. Um, things that go above and beyond what the government does when they hand out licenses. Um, and there's things we can do to make sure that Uber is the safest way to get around. Um, I think basically it's not just about making sure though that we're the safest way to get around, it's about being a part of an effort to make cities safer, period. And I think we can play a role there. Um, there are a lot of things we do. It's background checks, and I talked a little bit about that. It's, um, so we, it's background checks. It's, uh, it's making sure we get customer feedback uh, and take that customer feedback and act on it very quickly. It means, cust uh, it means customer ratings, so we have five-star ratings. It means GPS tracking. It means you can share your ride with friends and family uh, that uh, they can see your ride as it's happening. So those are sort of the early kinds of features that you roll out to provide for a safe platform. And then the second part of that is, well, what can you do to monitor cars to make sure that you're preventing things from happening in the moment, right? So like, uh, uh, are, there ways to, are there ways to watch for, uh, like, how is somebody driving? Are they driving recklessly? Could that be leading to an accident sometime soon? Um, uh, how many hours has a driver been on the road? Uh, there's a, a number of different data mining techniques to find behavior that, that might lead to something and preventing that. Um, so at the end of the day, we want our company, we want, um, we want our service to not just be the safest, but to be known to be innovating in how to bring safety to the, to the table. Um, and obviously have you know, a huge amount of empathy and, and, and just feel terrible about these situations that, that, that can happen from time to time. Okay, so you think in a few weeks or months or years, I can't feel, feel comfortable with uh, like, uh, taking a male Uber driver? I think most people who take Ubers feel far safer in them than in a taxi. You think so? I but do. they're controlled quite harshly. Uh, if you had a problem with a taxi driver, he felt unsafe, who would you contact? The company, taxi driver company. Do you think they would answer the phone? Of course. So in most they cities, all, they yeah, all have I, a number I, in there. Yeah, you I, can identify them easily. Take a, pic, take a picture, call the company. So, the guy's out. So we're, you know, I, there there are certain taxi systems that might be high quality. I haven't run into <laughs> a lot of them. And what I think we've seen is that quite often complaints do come into taxi uh, into taxi systems, and they're not dealt with at all. Now we can always be better, and we want to be better. Um, but I think the, the data bears out that 
we are the safest way to get around from point A to point B, but there's still a lot for us to do. Okay, I see. Now, I'd like to know how many people here have already taken a, an Uber taxi? Wow, about more than half. Now I would like to see as many hands I, as I just saw with questions for Travis. Go ahead. cars and what you think of that as competition in the future and jobs obviously no, no, no. yep um, no, I know. well look I think Google's spending a lot of time working on driverless car technology um, and there's going to be a whole new wave of disruption and innovation that comes from it uh, and a whole bunch of I think complex issues as it relates to labor not just here in Europe but really anywhere um, And I think, uh, I think you have to, you have to be pro-innovation in the long run. But you, again, I think what it comes down to is some of what I said today, which is, are there ways to partner with cities to bring this technology to bear in a way that um, sort of shepherds it in a safe and, and maybe more comfortable way? There are ways to innovate there too. Um, But it's going, to be, it's going to be probably the you know, significant disruption that, uh, you know, again, that I think Google's really spearheading that's going to be a, a, something that we all got to spend a lot of time making sure happens properly. Okay. Who else? So, um, Mike Butcher. So, where is he? Sorry. Okay. Oh. So, um, As an economist, you know, you say you're creating like 3,700 whatever jobs and I'm a fan of Uber because I like the service. Um, the question for me is what the net effect is. You know, how many jobs are lost somewhere else and here and I think it's actually amazing schedule of DLD team like to put the two speeches like the one we heard before and this one together because at the end of the day, um, disruption is also responsibility. Yeah. Um, And like your talks today and your talks a year ago have a very different tone. And the, the, the question here is, um, what's the responsibility at the end of the day to create such an amazing disruptive company? And how do you, you know, actually care about the side effects? Uh, we don't talk yeah. about pollution here, but like if you are a nuclear power company, you have to care about the side effects. Yeah. What do you think are your side effects? So, you know, I, I talked a little bit about some of the side effects and the very positive side effects uh, that happen when Uber comes to a city. You know, I think maybe San Francisco is probably the best example. It's our oldest city. Um, you know, all the research reports said that San Francisco was a $120 million a year spend on taxi and limo when we entered. Now, we do taxis as well as black cars, as well as as what we call UberX in San Francisco. But Uber on its own in San Francisco is now over $500 million a year, right? So it's multiplying the size of the pie, and that's when you see real job creation, not just destruction, um, and real value because you see how many people are coming into that system um, and, and, and sort of paying with, with their wallets, if that makes sense. Okay. Do we have to stop? Oh, we already have to stop. We're sorry about that. Thank you so Thank much, you. Travis, for being yeah. here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.